Hey, Pear fans. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. If you like listening to beautiful voices like ours instead of reading words, then head on over to Audible where you get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Truth, where you can choose from over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Hey, Paratruthers! Welcome to another amazing episode of Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And tonight we got a super interesting episode for you. Most people know this case. Uh, It's the Enfield Poltergeist case. We're going to be talking to Guy Lyon Playfair. He wrote a book called This House is Haunted, The Amazing Inside Story of the Enfield Poltergeist. Super interesting topic. Uh, Eric and I touched base on it last week where uh, the Warrens actually have done an investigation into this case as well. So it'll be interesting to get Guy's uh, opinion on this and uh, see where the story led him. Guy Lyon Playfair was born in India and educated in England, obtaining a degree in modern languages from Cambridge University. He then spent many years in Brazil as a freelance journalist for The Economist, Time, and the Associated Press. He also worked for four years in the press section of the U.S. Agency of International Development. Over the years, he has written 12 books, including The Flying Cow and Telepathy, The Twin Connection. Today, we have him on to discuss This House is Haunted, the amazing inside story of the Enfield Poltergeist. Now Parachute presents This House is Haunted with special guest Guy Lion Playfair. All right, and we have Guy Lion Playfair on the line with us. Guy, welcome to Paratruth Radio. So tonight we wanted to talk to you about This is Haunted, the amazing inside story of the Enfield Poltergeist. Uh why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this particular case? Uh, well, I literally came across it by accident. I was sitting at a lecture at the SPR, that's the Society for Psychical Research in London, of which I was a member and still am. And uh, somebody popped up and said he, he'd heard of a new poltergeist case in the suburb of Enfield, and it looked like a good one, and he would like some help in investigating it because he couldn't handle it on his own. So as I was sitting right in front of him, I could hardly get away because we have a tradition in the SPR that we help each other out when when, um, when asked. And also, it's always a good thing not to um, hunt alone. I would just have somebody with you to make sure you're behaving yourself and seeing what you think you see. So that's how I got involved. I, mean, I, I went out there, I think, the following evening and was perfectly satisfied that it was a genuine case. It had all the traditional uh, signs and, and the family had never even heard of the word poltergeist. They, they kept on referring to it as the polka dice, which is rather nice. And um, it, we just decided to stay there until it ended not realizing that it would go on for more than a year, which, which it did. And we, we hung in there and um, stayed until it stopped. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Now, during your year of, of investigation, what was the progression of the haunting like? I know you mentioned that it began with Knox, but yeah. to what degree did it really go to before it began to settle back down? It followed a very um, typical pattern. Um, in fact, I, I compiled a list of symptoms of poltergeist cases. And the curious thing is that they tend to happen in the same order. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you'll get the same sequence of events in London as you would get in Brazil or South Africa or Iceland or anywhere. It's a universal phenomenon, and it, it tends to be it tends to follow a very established pattern. And uh, knocking is typically the first sign of activity. Mm-hmm. And then you get small objects moving around. In this case, it was um, pieces of uh, Lego brick and occasional marbles. And then it moved up to larger objects like furniture, chairs, and tables, and so on. And then after a couple of months, we got the really weird stuff where thing, things started going through walls and, and um, some really quite excessively strange incidents took place, which um, people find very hard to believe, and so did I, but they, they happened. And um, finally, the thing um, just faded out. They, they tend to go out um, very, very very much of an anticlimax, and um, that's what happened to this one. Okay. <laughs> now, a lot of people have different definitions of what a poltergeist is. Some people believe it's an actual entity. Some people believe it's psychic phenomena coming from usually a young girl or someone that is coming into maturity. Um, what is your definition of the, of a poltergeist? Well, poltergeist is simply a word which um, we use to describe something we don't understand. So it's not very precise. Okay. It, it is, in fact, it's a syndrome. You know, it's a, a syndrome is a collection of, sy- of symptoms and we, we know something about the symptoms there are quite a lot of them about uh, 15 or 20 altogether and um, we just refer to them as poltergeist of course when the word was 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 made popular by Luther in the 16th century the, the, the only solution around was really that it had to be the work of the devil because mm-hmm. that's how they thought it in those days and mm-hmm. Unfortunately, some people still do, but we don't uh, um, think that way at all. And um, the, the phenomena remain the same. It's just that the interpretations are different. And now it, it appears that there is some curious relation between the state of mind of the the epicenter, the, the person around whom it all revolves, and the things that happen. But they're, they're, they're still totally mystifying. I mean. You know, chairs and tables don't just turn over on their own. It's it's not possible. Right. And yet it happens. <laughs> it's like Galileo said, you know, sorry, the earth is going around the sun whether you like it or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, not, not every investigator does this, but many do, and I think they <laughs> should. Uh, and that's pretty much... Uh, psychologically evaluating the subject that they're investigating, uh, whether it's the people or otherwise. Mm. Um, so when you went into the house the first time and you sat down with the girls and or with their mother, what type of evaluation did you do to, to try to figure out where their mindset was and what was really going on to figure out if anything was fabricated and et cetera? Well, we, we went to the, to the experts. We had um, Janet spent a whole month in the, um, Maudsley Hospital, which is one of the top psychiatric hospitals in the world. And she was literally taken apart and put together again, and they couldn't find anything physically wrong with her at all. She she was x-rayed all over and questioned on everything imaginable. Mm -hmm. And she was suffering from sort of mild stress following her parents' divorce. And uh, she was a bit... Unhappy, and she was also reaching reaching the age of puberty. She was um, eleven when it started, and twelve um, when it ended. And um, it was still a, she. She wasn't in any way, um, as the psychiatrist in charge said, she, that she was really didn't stand out. If you'd taken a hundred girls of her age off the street, um, they would all have to, they would all have sort of hang-ups about growing up and. Um, becoming adults and things. Which, um, th- th- that's the real mystery. There was no obvious reason why Janet should have produced the, the extraordinary effects that she did. Right. I'm sure we just don't know. Now, was it af- just after the divorce that all of this kind of started taking place? Yeah. It, it was, uh, I think, about two or three months, yes. Okay. That's right. 
So in a sense, it it does kind of revolve around a, a young girl it, that a lot of people, you know, believe that poltergeist cases do. So that's actually really interesting. Yes, definitely, it definitely uh, evolved around the the youngest uh, daughter, Janet, who uh, was the lively one. She was very very um, extrovert and, and um, athletic and, and active and so on. Mm-hmm. Her older sister was much quieter and. Um, didn't get involved quite so much, but but she did slightly. But but, but Janet was the main focus right. of the activity. Although it actually, on one occasion, it, it went on when we got Janet out of the house altogether, and uh, we still had things happening in, inside. So so it was um, not entirely due due to her presence. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now during the case, there there was a point in which. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was also Janet who levitated at one point. Um, yes. Okay. Not only that, but she was seen from the street by okay. uh, by the um, police woman who was supervising the school crossing. Mm-hmm. She actually saw her going up and down, just just like in that um, film of the Exorcist. You know that that was actually <laughs> true. I mean that 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 was based on a real case, and and it was. A lot more accurate than people might like to think. Mm-hmm. And um, yes, Janet was seen levitating and, and um, sort of going around in circles in midair. And um, we've interviewed the uh, woman who reported that incident numerous times. And she's absolutely stuck to her story. And she's a very down to earth type. And um, she's got a very responsible job for making sure that. Kids get across the road without being flattened by the cars, <laughs> and uh, she she knows what to look for, and she keeps her eyes open, and and she saw um, Janet um, at least two two to three feet off the, off the bed, which incidentally didn't bounce at all. It was it was a solid mattress, and um, she's stuck to that story ever since, and so has the. Um, tradesman who was passing at the time who, who saw this enormous sofa cushion just appear on the roof of the house. Mm-hmm. You know, one, one second it was not there and the next second it was. And he still he hasn't got over that today. I mean, the, he still won't talk about it. It freaked the hell out of him. Wow. Oh. Well. All right, folks, before we get too much further into it, we're going to go to our first break. We've been talking to Guy Lyon Playfair about his book, This is this House is Haunted, The Amazing Inside Story of the Enfield Poltergeist. We will be right back after Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Now, Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Did you know that Germany is a country of about 81 million people? and that only about 230,000 of which are actually Jewish? Also, did you know that after World War II, many Germans had never met a Jewish person, and hence have had trouble associating with Jews, or even seeing them as anything but victims? Enter Rent-A-Jew. Yeah, you heard that right. Despite the terrible title for an organization, the service, according to Vox.com, isn't exactly as weird as the name implies. It's basically a seminar service. Basically, some organization hires Rent-A-Jew to put together a presentation. Then Rent-A-Jew sends over some Jews, mostly young volunteers, who talk to the assembled students about what it's like being Jewish. This leads unknowing people to see and understand that Jews are indeed more than just victims of World War II but that they also want to be seen in their own right. This was Eric's Random Fact of the Day. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking to Guy Lyon Playfair about This House is Haunted, the amazing inside story of the Enfield Poltergeist. Now, just before break, we talked about uh, Janet levitating 
Uh, did you guys witness any type of levitation or things being thrown across the room, that sort of thing, when you were there? Oh, heavens, dozens of times, yes, certainly. I mean, um, I had a heavy armchair sliding across the floor right in front of my nose, and um, numerous uh, small objects would be thrown, and, and things would drop from the ceiling, and... Um, sometimes um, appear in very unusual ways, you know, they would bounce off the walls, which objects don't normally do. And, um, yes, it just went on and on. I mean, as I said, the the um, examples would, would fill a book, and then they have. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, did any of the act- any activity whatsoever, um, did you notice that it was more active at a particular hour than another? It was it was very active first thing in the morning when they woke up. Yes, I mean, what, what one of the strangest episodes when, when I was actually sleeping in the house, which I frequently did, um, was early in the morning when they woke up. The um, the gas fire was pulled out of the wall. Mm-hmm. It was luckily it was not connected to the gas. Otherwise, goodness knows what would have happened. But um, it, it was literally. Pulled out and, and and bent the bent the brass pipe that was holding it into the um, into the into the wall, and it was actually cemented into the brickwork. It shouldn't have moved moved at all. It had been there for sort of mm-hmm. 50 years. It was, it was obviously put in when the house was built and um, no longer used because um, they didn't have uh, running gas. But uh, I, I was there when that happened. That was extremely odd. <clears throat> Now, uh, we talked about in the morning, but as the girls were sleeping, did any type of activity go on, or was it only when they were awake? Um, no, there's a, there's a popular belief that things go bump in the night, but in fact they don't. They, they go bump in the daytime, <laughs> and they, they um, start as soon as people wake up. And in fact, once you, once you get the girls to sleep... Uh, that is the best way of stopping the action, and I managed to um, to do that once or twice by, by a form of a kind of hypnosis, which um, uh, it, it was very effective because with children it usually is, mm-hmm. and um, it was quite new to them, so that they found it quite interesting, and it did work, and it did did stop the action. One or two minor exceptions, but generally that that's what you do in, in an emergency. You try to, try to get them to sleep, and you won't get things going bump in the night, I'm afraid, and, uh, and wait until the next day. Mm-hmm. Now, with the great numerous amount of evidence that you have uh, in regards to audio and just things that you've seen, have you... At any time, taking photographs and whatnot, did you ever catch an apparition or anything like that? Or is it mostly just audio and visual things that you saw with your own eyes? Well, we we, we didn't have much luck with still photography, but we, we were lucky to have a, a professional cameraman from the um, Daily Mirror newspaper. That was the largest circulation paper in the country at the time. And he, he got very interested, and he came back in his own time. Mm-hmm. And he did, yes, he did capture... Uh, several sequences using what they what they call a motor drive. I don't know if they still use them today. I don't know if they do, but it was um, a little gadget they used to have on Nikon cameras, where you'd press the press the button and you'd get about four or five pictures would fire in rapid succession. Mm-hmm. So it was like a little miniature um, um, extract of, of a cine film, and. Um, Graham did that several times. He got through miles of film, <laughs> and um, he co- he saw several things. Uh, we had the curtain blowing into the room, uh, although the window was closed, and twisting itself around into a tight spiral, which Janet had earlier described, and we hadn't we found that rather hard to believe. But the, the, there it was on the film. And best of all, I think, there was one sequence where you see the, the bedclothes being pulled off Janet's bed when she simply doesn't move, move at all. Mm-hmm. She's absolutely motionless. And yet the bedclothes are 
sort of ripped off. And there was another sequence where um, two, two pillows were thrown in different directions, which is very hard to do. And uh, there were one or two others, I think. So, yes, we did, we did get some evidence, not um, um, as much as we'd like. And unfortunately, um, video cameras were luxury items in those days. You just couldn't get a hold of them. Um, we did manage to get hold of one, and it wasn't very successful. But um, audio, audio tape was masses of uh, sound effects on that. <clears throat> what prompted the en- the ending of this case? What uh, did everything finally die down, and that's why you guys left, or had you just done enough, or the most you could have done? It was a tremendous anticlimax, I'm afraid. It was not not the way it should have ended, like in. Uh, the average horror film, you know, with all sorts of fire and brimstone and screaming <laughs> devils and all that. It's, it, that. That's not how it is. It just stops. Okay. It stops for no reason. And um, in this case, it was stopped by a Dutch uh, medium called Dono, who um, came over with a friend of mine who worked for the Dutch newspaper, the, the Telegraph, and he just rang me up one day and said, "Would you like to? Um, would you like this fellow to come over and stop it?" And I said, "Yes, please, as soon as you can." So he came over, and as far as I know, he didn't do anything. He he didn't speak English very well, and he sat in the bedroom on his own, uh, as if he was sort of meditating, and um, uh, had a brief chat with my friend interpreting. And that was it, really. There was, there was nothing happened after following his visit. So um, whether it was entirely due to some kind of suggestion, which I certainly don't rule out, you know, if the children thinks it's ended, then it has. And um, we had a very brief sort of encore three or four months later, which only lasted for, for about a, half a day or so and, and didn't... Um, develop into anything. So that that was that. And it, there's been no trouble since. And both, both the girls have grown up and got married, living happily ever after, I hope. <clears throat> so do you, you don't really keep in touch with them anymore? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, one of them, one of them is living uh, abroad somewhere. I think her okay. husband is, works on an oil rig, so I couldn't, goodness knows where he is. So stuck somewhere in the middle of the North Sea, I think. But um, I'm still in touch with Janet, and, and um, she's got her own family, two nice uh, her clever boys who are both at university, mm-hmm. and a very, a very sympathetic husband. And she's okay. She's got over it. Wow. And she, she hates publicity. She would never take part in something like this. She just doesn't right. want to be, be, be um, sort of labeled forever as, as the, the haunted, haunted girl. And right. She's, she's, Living her own normal life. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants to be labeled as that person. Actually, uh, now, in has there ever been any other cases that you had investigated after this particular case? Um, let me think. Yes, we did one, um, one together with Boris, but I, I got interested in all kinds of other things. And frankly, investigating poltergeists is pretty exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's also quite expensive. Yeah. Because uh, you have to keep going there. And it, it was a long journey for me. I, it was almost an hour's traveling each way. Okay. And it cost quite a bit. And in, in, um, I had changed trains twice. And um, I just wanted to do something a bit closer to home. So um, uh, I don't, don't really feel like taking on another poltergeist and you'll leave that to somebody a bit younger. <laughs> <laughs> they are very, very exhausting indeed and, and you never know what the hell is going to happen next and, and usually something does. So, so, it's, right. it's, so you, you need more than one person to do it properly. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> now you've written, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 12 books so far. Yeah. Um what is pretty much the genre of your books? Are, are they all pretty much similar in regards to psychology and parapsychology and whatnot, or do you kind of branch out with? Uh, well, with no, they're not, they're not similar at all. There's quite a variety. Um, 
Do you want me to list them all? Sure. If you want to, feel free. Ah, dear. Well, um, there were two two that were based on my um, experiences in Brazil, mm-hmm. which, which were very, very interesting, including several uh, very, very active poltergeist cases. Um, they were published in 1975 and 6, uh, the fine car and the indefinite boundary. And then I did a straight science book called The Cycles of Heaven, which is all about um, uh, cosmic forces like, like, like um, um, magnetic effects of, of uh, solar radiation and that kind of thing, and how, how the um, sun and the moon and other objects in the sky actually influence life on Earth. So there was nothing uh, paranormal about that. That was straightforward science. Then, for a bit of light relief, I did a guide to haunted pubs, which was great fun, and uh, most enjoyable research I've ever done. And I, then I did a book about memory training, and one about hypnosis. And then I got involved with Uri Geller and, and collaborated with him, which was also great fun and very, very enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And um, where are we? Then I wrote a, um, a, book, um, book, a book about twin twin telepathy, which was um, actually my favorite one, although it hasn't sold at all well um, for all kinds of reasons, which is a pity, because I think it's very important and, and um, we are, I'm still working on that and, and making quite a, a lot of interesting discoveries. Mm-hmm. And um, I've done one or two others that I just can't remember, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, I've written all sorts of chapters in other anthologies and um, dozens, hundreds of articles and so on, and um, radio and TV stuff, so I've been pretty active on the whole. Oh, great. Mm-hmm. All right, Kai. Well, it is time to let you go. So I did want to give you a chance to tell everybody where they can find you, find all of your books, and any other information you want to give out. Um, if you get onto the um, Amazon, uh, if you're in the USA, you go onto Amazon.com, or in Europe, it's .co, and then UK for, for England, and and um, that lists that the four of them are still in print. The Brazilian one and the um, twin book and the hypnosis one and the um, uh, well, they're all they're all listed there and um, you can you can order them and um, read bits of them, some of them, and um, hope you enjoy them. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank yeah. you so much for being on, and maybe sometime down the road we can talk to you again. Yep. Good. Well, all the best. Yep. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. All right, folks. That was Guy Lion Playfair. So, uh, interesting guest, uh, interesting book. Uh, it is late for him, so we didn't want to keep him too long. Uh, interesting concept uh, about the poltergeist. I, I believe, have we talked about the poltergeist before? On the show? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I don't think we've actually focused on the poltergeist, but we've talked a little bit about it, brought it up. Okay. So, uh, out of all of the information he was giving us, what are what are your thoughts on it? Uh, do you think that it's more of a like tele telekinetic phenomenon? Do you think there's more of a spiritual aspect to it? What's your thoughts? Uh, you know, I don't think so much telekinetic, but you know, it's interesting that he said that. Janet at the time was, you know, 11, 12 years old uh, going through puberty, which is interesting because I think and this isn't like scientifically proven, obviously, but many believe that spirits are more active at times of stress. And you would imagine during puberty and whatnot, there's a great amount of stress plus a divorce happening with the parents. Mm. Uh, So it's very plausible that because of the situation, it would stir up some type of spiritual uh, haunting. And I think based on how the girls' emotions were, you know, whether whether they were scared or, uh, uh, you know, happy or sad or whatever, and not just the girls. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they had a uh, a brother as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think based on that alone would determine how active the poltergeist would have been. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting that most of all they have in regards to evidence is audio, which is great because I think that's one of the most probably the majority of what everyone who's in a paranormal investigator has these mm-hmm. days. Even uh, it's difficult to get video or photographic images of spirits. Uh, but they, he, you know, guy had mentioned that they did have some things, uh, on video, nothing spectacular, nothing that's like point blank. Yeah. Look, it's a spirit, but nonetheless, you know, it's always those images that we get that are like, Hmm, questionable, you know, what, what can that be? And you can't really explain it. So yeah, you know, I think it's definitely a spirit thing. I think it's weird that it just kind of ended, you know, uh, and nobody really knows why or how. Uh, other than the fact the medium came in, but as this guy said, he didn't think the medium really did too much uh, before the spirit left. So uh, the other thing, though, is the girls did admit to fabricating about two percent of the hauntings. It is after quote, it was started coming, coming uh, down, which yeah. naturally makes many other investigators around the world believe that the entire thing was a fraud, uh, and obviously. Only those who really were there, such as Guy, can tell us whether or not it was true, real or not, you know, uh, right. without being there ourselves and witnessing things moving with our own eyes. None can say, you know, because I, I can stand here today or in this case, sit here since I'm doing a radio show. But, you know, I could sit here and say uh, so a true, a true, a truth. I could tell you a true story about a chair that moved by itself at my sister's house when we were talking about God. Interesting. Creepy. Uh, but many people who hear that story won't believe it's true because I don't have the evidence to support it. It's all visual. You know, it's it's what I saw. It's what I witnessed. But I don't have any evidence to prove it other than my sister who had also witnessed it. Right. So, you know, it, things like this is really up in the air. And I think it's you have to you have to look at it from both perspectives. You know, uh, I think we have to open our minds and say, OK, here's the evidence that guy and Maurice had gathered together and this is what they claim is real, but they also have the evidence that is faked and they knew what was faked. Uh, you know, guys said it very clearly during our interview here that some of the evidence that they have or some of the things that happened was clearly fake and they knew it was fake and they knew the girls were doing it. But yet there are other things that just were unexplainable that they couldn't, you know, pinpoint. So I don't know. I, I, I mean, Again, long. I do a lot of long answers for, for the questions you ask. But, yeah, I think it definitely was spiritual. I don't really – I personally don't really believe in the psychokinetic type of thing, uh, telepathy and all that. Uh, not that it doesn't exist, but I've never seen it. Uh, the evidence to support it is very vague. So, I mean, maybe that's something we can have Guy on in the, about in the future because he did write the book uh, Telepathy, The Twin Connection, which is – Interesting. And then that's I th- probably very different from what we're thinking about telepathy. But right. Yeah. I think that book kind of goes along the lines of how twins can communicate without saying a right. word or think the same thing and that sort of thing, which is actually a phenomenon in and of itself. <laughs> like <laughs> it's kind of weird. But uh, one thing that uh, I thought was fascinating was he put it in the book that the the young girl Janet talked in two different voices, one in a, a man's older man's voice and one in her own, and he shows the wavelength difference. And uh, one thing that was interesting was that you had brought up something to me about a week ago on another podcast about them talking about men and trying to sound more manly and making a deeper voice, and uh, you know how you can put your hand to your throat and kind of either feel it or adjust it to where you can do it without straining yourself. Um, so I think it's, that's one of those things that it's pretty easy to determine what's going on because yes, it can be faked, but that little girl's voice would have, her, her throat would have been like super sore afterwards if she was faking it. Yeah. So, well, We've seen people go through a lot more for a lot less. So, well, I mean, it's very true too. <laughs> very possible, but you know, it, I think we have to actually listen to the videotape itself and see just how much of a difference there is between the girl's voice and this whatever the spirit is that's coming through her. Uh, you know, one thing that I noticed, and I don't remember, I don't think he mentioned it, but uh, he mentioned it off air. 
uh, that he doesn't really believe. Not that he doesn't believe, but he doesn't like the word possession, mm. you know, particularly. Uh, and I think that's the same for many different people. You know, some people believe in possession. Some people don't. Uh, and what is exactly possession? Obviously, we have a worldview of what possession is. It's basically just a spirit taking over someone's body. But do they actually enter the body or is it more of a manipulation from outside? And that's kind of like where we get into I brought it up, you know, possession, affliction, oppression, et cetera, et cetera. Each word demanding something different and a different source or way for the spirit to manipulate and do things through uh, a person. Um, but there's plenty of people who will straightforward claim, yeah, it's there's possession. It is possession. If it's going to talk through you, it's most likely, you know, uh, inside the body or somehow manipulating this the soul uh, in order to get the words to speak. Otherwise, you were talking about telepathy, which – you know, it, again, is more of a it, it's a different discussion because I don't believe that demons can read minds, mm. nor can they uh, really put in a sense they, they they can't put their mind into yours, but they can manipulate your surroundings to make you believe or think things that they want you to think. Uh, and, and obviously, I can't get into too much detail there because I've. I'm not a demon. I, I wouldn't know how, how it would work. I don't know how spirits do it. At least, but not um, that we know of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, actually, since you brought that up, uh, something else that happened off air. You know, sometimes we have these conversations with uh, with our guests off air. And one things that are, one of the things I brought up was uh, The Conjuring 2, mm. which came out about a year ago. And many of you out there listening right now have watched The Conjuring 2. And you notice something about the story revolving around this crooked man. And we see at the end, uh, kind of like bits and pieces throughout the film, but at the end, the crooked man shows up and it's this demonic looking creature wearing a hat, a uh, really tall, really lanky. Um, and so I asked him about that. I asked him if there was anything, you know, about the crooked man that came up from the girls or if they witnessed anything. And it was just this thought about the fabrication of Hollywood and how they like to go over the top with some of the stories instead of telling the truth. And Guy had said that there is absolutely nothing about the crooked man in the actual story. When he was there, the girls never said anything about the crooked man. The crooked man just didn't exist. The only thing about an old man was the voice that came from the girl. Uh, so it's interesting to hear that because you get to see how fabricated Hollywood films are uh, just for story's sake and for uh, entertainment. You know, it's a way to draw people in because a lot of people aren't going to go see the type of story that Guy witnessed. They want to see something much more over the top. So I thought that was interesting and something I wanted to just mention to everyone here on air. So, Well, one thing that uh, we, we didn't get a chance to, to talk to him about is there is the uh, phenomenon known as the hat man now that has mm -hmm. come out recently. And it almost makes you wonder if they were just merging several stories together to get a more dramatic effect. Because like we've said in Paranormal Investigation – you don't get the evidence that half of these TV shows or even on a lot of these movies, you don't get a lot of that activity going on when you're doing an actual investigation. One thing right. I found fascinating was the fact that we had talked to him about the activity happening during a certain part of the day and mm -hmm. that it actually stopped when the girls were sleeping. Mm -hmm. Now, in most poltergeist cases, I believe that is traditionally what's going on is it's surrounding this this one particular girl. It's usually – and this is the odd thing. It's usually a blonde girl, and it, I, it just baffles me, but it, there must be something to it. So if you guys know anything about that, please comment in the comments below or let us know. But uh, it was just interesting that he had told us, you know, it's not at night that – that it, it goes bump in the night. It's during the daytime. So, and, and that's one thing that uh, I think we've all said that I, it really doesn't matter. Yes. It, sometimes it seems like in the evening things are amped up, but it, it can be anytime during the day. So um, yeah, one thing that uh, one other thing that I found fascinating about this was the woman seeing Janet uh, levitating and, <laughs> You know, if these girl little girls were faking it, that particular instance, and the woman could have been mistaken. I'm not saying that, but 
in this particular instance, do you think that it would have been easily faked uh, for anything that that guy witnessed uh, that these girls were doing? I mean, I don't see any reason for her to fake anything unless she's being paid off for it. Um, so I don't know. You know, it's possible. There's a couple of things. You know, it's possible that she actually saw what she thought she saw. Um and that would make the most sense because what I mean, and I don't think she would be gathering fame unless she wanted well, to gather some fame. And she was fame, a police but, officer, so paying a police officer off would be a bribe, and not <laughs> I mean, you, you would be arrested yeah, for that. So right, um, but you know, and many people. Here's the interesting thing: is many investigators today who have looked into the Enfield poltergeist believe and claim that the uh, that the levitation of Janet wasn't really levitation, but it was simply Janet jumping off the bed. And when you look at some of the photographs, it looks as if she's jumping off the bed. Uh, and I've looked at the bed itself, and there wasn't much de- indentation or anything like that, anything that would necessarily show the bed moving before jumping. Um, but Guy said it was a very solid bed. It wasn't something that would normally you would normally bounce on. Right. So that could, that could uh, definitely be – the reason behind why you can't see any movement on the bed in the pictures. Uh, but yeah, when you look at the picture itself, it looks like she's jumping, going up and falling as opposed to levitating. Uh, but as we saw or listened or heard, geez, as we heard from guy, the woman who claimed to witness it was outside the house. She was down on the floor level. And if I'm not mistaken, the room was upstairs. And so her angle, her perception would be seeing the girl in midair and not really seeing the bed at all. So it's very possible that the girl was jumping and, uh, you know, she knew the haunting. And so she thought she was levitating or she was simply levitating. Now, this is, again, something that is just between two opinions. Uh, now, one person is going to say, like a guy who claims it really was real and that she was, you know, circling around the air and floating and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's very it's very possible. But, you know, standing here, I can't say I didn't see it in my own eyes. You know, right. it's either I take his word for it or I discredit it. And I can't do either because I don't know. So. All right, folks, we are going to go ahead and take our second. Back after Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. How's it going, Parafans? Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines, and these headlines are from abcnews.go.com. Too few flushes get legislative candidate thrown off ballot. A Democratic candidate's run for the Pennsylvania legislature is down the drain, partly because he used too little water at the house he claimed as his residence. A state judge threw Frederick Ramirez off the ballot in the race for an open house seat in Philadelphia. The judge found that low water and electric use at the house Ramirez claimed as his residence showed he really didn't live in the district. According to testimony, for 11 months, he was billed for a total of about 3,000 gallons of water, or the equivalent of less than two toilet flushes a day on average. His lawyer said the low numbers showing zero use in some months are misleading because of how bills are calculated. Neighbors testified they never saw Ramirez on their block, the bedroom light was always on, and the home never seemed to put out trash for curbside pickup. The fact that there are no photographs or pictures on the walls, combined with the fact that his daughter's room is still decorated for an infant, more strongly reveals that the candidate is not domiciled at the house, but merely uses that location as a convenient place to stay when he is working at a nearby clinic he owns, wrote Commonwealth Court Judge Ann Covey. The seat became vacant with the January 3rd resignation of Democratic Representative Leslie Acosta. She had been re-elected in November, about two months after her secret guilty plea of conspiracy to commit money laundering to a federal judge became public. Ramirez's lawyer, Adam Bonin, said the property is indeed Ramirez's home, Bonin said he is considering his options, including a potential appeal. Obviously, and especially given when this decision was handed down, time is of the essence, Bonin said. The judge's ruling leaves just one candidate on the ballot for the March 21st special election, Republican Lucinda Little, in what is an overwhelmingly Democratic district. I feel that justice has prevailed, Little said. 
We need a representative that actually lives in the district, that actually cares about the district. A spokeswoman for the Department of State, which oversees elections, said the agency's lawyers were examining whether Democrats are legally allowed to pick a new candidate. The head of the state, Democrats, said he expects his party to take some sort of action in the coming days. If he... If he's not the candidate, we need to find somebody, even if it's for a write-in, said Marcel Grone, the party chairman. That said, it's certainly preferable to have someone someone on the ballot. The race will not affect partisan control of the state house, where Republicans hold a 121 to 82 majority. Attempted robbers apologize after victim rebuffs crime. A Milwaukee woman held up at gunpoint by two men rebuffed their attempt to rob her and got an apology before they fled. Christy Welch was returning home Monday following a ceramics class when the two men approached her while she was still in her car. Welch told them she just had surgery and didn't have any money. That's when the two men apologized and said, God bless you, before taking off. The encounter was caught on video surveillance. Welch's husband, Alford, tells WTMJ-TV he installed a motion-activated camera outside their home many years ago. Welch says that without the video, no one would have believed that someone put a gun to her face, then blessed her, and left without causing any harm. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we were on the phone a little while ago with Guy Lyon Playfair with his book, uh, in discussion of his book, This House is Haunted, The Amazing Inside Story of the Enfield Poltergeist. Since then, we have let Guy go, and we have been talking about poltergeists, both in general and, of course, the Enfield Poltergeist itself. Uh, We are, of course, coming up to the end of the show here. But, Justin, based on the evidence that Guy had shared with us, based on the evidence that you saw through your research, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you think this is something that was that is real? Do you think there was a lot of too much fabrication to consider it, you know, a legit haunting or um, what are your ideas? With a poltergeist case, it's it's kind of hard because you don't really know what's going on. Mm-hmm. But. From what he was saying, and he witnessed this himself, and I'm not saying what he witnessed was wrong. We only have his and Maurice Gross's word, and the family, of course, uh, saying that this happened. Unfortunately, like we had said, they weren't able to get any type of video evidence. There, There wasn't that type of technology back then that they could have it readily available. Um right. They he talked about some pictures that they were able to capture um, that were odd, but not necessarily paranormal in any way. So, in my opinion, is it possible that it was a spirit? Yeah, I think that that's a good possibility. Um, a lot of the things that he discussed, I think it would be hard to fabricate. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, like you had said, he did admit that the the girls did start messing with them towards the end after activity started dying down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So I I honestly think that there is a a spiritual aspect to this, but um, it it, it kind of goes along those lines of like you said, we weren't there. We can't really say for sure, but from what he's telling me, yeah, I think it's more of a spiritual thing. All right. Well, on that note, I think it's time to go. Folks, uh, if you want to get in contact with us, obviously, paratruthradio at gmail.com. Email is always nice and quick. Uh, otherwise, hit us up on Facebook. Send us a photo on Instagram or uh, message us on Twitter. Yep. And next week, we've got Linda Godfrey coming back to talk about her most recent book, Monsters Among Us. 
uh, as you guys know, we love our cryptids, so it's going to be an interesting, interesting show. So Mm -hmm. until next week, folks, where you will find us same time, same channel. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can find them at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and the Fringe Radio Network. Or for a one-time fix of all of your Paratruth needs, simply drop in to paratruthradio.com. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for brand new updates on our show every day. Finally, we love bringing you fresh, entertaining media each and every week, but we can't do it without you. So please check out our Patreon account. Simply go to paratruthradio.com, click on the Patreon logo, and help us to continue bringing you the latest and greatest in paranormal research.